What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we are covering the Watchmen. Now for a lot of you guys who are new to DC Rebirth, the Watchmen is like, they're like the central focal of all this stuff, right? Like people are looking around and they're like, yeah, the Watchmen, like I'm really excited to see what happens with the Watchmen because we don't really know what's going on with them. We know the Watchmen are part of DC Rebirth, but we don't know how they got there. We presume that it's because of the events of Barry Allen during Flashpoint, which created the New 52, DC's line-wide reboot, but we don't know how far reaching the events of Dr. Manhattan go. We don't know how far reaching all this stuff goes. All we know is that the Watchmen are there in some form or fashion, and Dr. Manhattan stole 10 years from everybody, and basically everything that we read in the origin stories of these DC characters when the New 52 first launched is not entirely true. There's more to their histories that we're simply not aware of. And so the idea here is to basically cover the original Watchmen story, and the reason behind this is because it gives people context. When fans, when they read forums and people are just like, yeah, the Watchmen in the DC universe, it gives them context. It gives people an understanding standing as to why everybody is so excited about the Watchmen themselves. Now, if you've seen the Watchmen movie, what you'll actually find is that a lot of the stuff in this comic really goes hand in hand with the film. It was really a, a pretty faithful adaptation in terms of how the characters were depicted and so on and so forth, at least in the first little bit of this. I mean, like any movie, there's certain liberties that are taken by the directors, producers, actors, so on and so forth when it comes to adapting uh, something that came in book form or comic book form to an actual film. But there'll be enough closeness here that you'll be able to find some measure of, of recognizability. Now, the cool thing about this is that we initially pick up with the death of the comedian. Remember, that's one of the first big things that happens because the Watchmen is nothing if not a whodunit mystery, which is to say, who in the world killed the comedian? That's really the basis behind all this. Now, of course, with these detectives going through and piecing things together, kind of, you know, looking at the evidence at hand, indicating there was a struggle, that there was basically a fight, that's something that I hope you notice here. In the movie, you basically saw this fight play out and then the aftermath with the police investigating. And this this, you get it interspersed in between. Now, of course, the indication here is that the comedian was a man of such a stature that he's not somebody easily toppable. But the comedian is not going to get killed by some average high school student or some guy with a gun. That's not how that works. When it comes to the Watchmen universe, these stories are a lot more grounded. They're a lot more realistic. They're a lot more tangible. That's why Dr. Manhattan is really the only guy with godlike powers. Everybody else, for the most part, is just your regular guy. They have little things that set them apart. But on the whole, they're really not that different. That was the basis behind this. The Watchmen story was as much a critique on existing superheroes as it was a comic book story in and of itself. But the idea here is to ask the question, who possibly could have killed this guy? Now, of course, the police who were investigating these detectives really just kind of write it off and say, well, maybe it was a couple guys and maybe he just pissed somebody off and that's just kind of the way it goes. But notice how it's thrown away. It's not like they say, man, this is priority number one. We have to figure this out. This again is really hearkening back to the nature of superhero comics. If for example, we were to pick up a story where the Justice League walk into the Watchtower and find Batman dead on the floor and bleeding, well then it would be this great big huge thing where it's like this is the number one priority for the Justice League. Everything stops. In this story, it's not that way. For the most part, everybody just continues going about their normal lives. Yeah, the comedian died and that sucks, but it's because they never really knew anything about each other. They were so removed. They were so isolated. Again, another hit at the old school comics that existed out there. This idea that when it came to uh, the original superheroes, it was just to say, really DC's Justice League, there was a time when none of them knew the other's identities. Superman did not know the Flash was Barry Allen. Now, Superman didn't know that Hal Jordan was the Green Lantern. They kept their identities hidden. Now, the goal was to basically have the Justice League reveal their identities for the purpose of creating cohesiveness, familiarity, to create some measure of relatability. With regards to, uh, to the Watchmen, it's not that way. These guys fought as a team, sure, but they are by no means friends for the most part. Some of them are, like me, you know, a few here and there, but they were really just more friends of circumstance as opposed to genuine, actual friends. Now, of course, this comes in to the introduction of Rorschach. And for the most part, Rorschach doesn't really say anything in the beginning of the story, which is one of the cool things about it. Rorschach's really well known in the Watchmen movie for having these awesome monologues and like these journal entries and so on and so forth. He's very similar to Punisher in that regard. Now, regarding the character of Night Owl, this is when we start to switch over to Dan Dryberg and Hollis Mason. 
person. Now, Night Owl is a, a concept like Captain America, right? You know, Captain America is a title that's basically given to people. Anybody who puts on the suit, wears the shield, that's Captain America. What this does is it begins to sort of expand on the Watchmen mythos to a degree by introducing a group called the Minutemen. Now, the Watchmen are not necessarily the first iteration of the superhero team. Uh, for the most part, the Watchmen are just kind of the more recent adaptation of the team. But with regards to going back really in the earliest days, there were the Minutemen. And the Minutemen were, again, just regular people who got together and they got tired of seeing criminals running rampant. They got tired of seeing cops unable to deal with the various crimes that were committed. And so the idea was that the Minutemen were literally going to be vigilantes. They were going to be superheroes or they're going to be people who went out and they stopped crime from happening or punished those who were criminals. But because of the fact that Hollis Mason was the first Night Owl and Dan Dryberg picked up the mantle, what this means is there's some sort of connection between the two of them. Even if it's only through the title itself, Dan Dryberg is continuing this legacy created by Hollis Mason. And again, this hits at the nature of titles versus characters who are inherently who they are. Superman is inherently Superman. He was born as the character Superman. You know, he was born with super strength, super speed. But with someone like Batman, he witnessed his parents being shot in Crime Alley in Gotham City and then decided to become a caped crusader. And that's how all this stuff really begins to tie together. That's why it works. Now, of course, with Dan Dryberg getting back home, he basically runs into Rorschach. And this is, again, when we start to figure out a little bit of the things that were going on behind the scenes. This idea that before this story took place, the Watchmen were a legitimate superhero team. The Watchmen carried on the legacy of the Minutemen. The Watchmen served the purpose of keeping crime basically curbed within the city of New York as best they possibly could. The issue with this is that in the 1970s, there was a bill that was passed that banned superhero activity in the form of individuals who wore masks. And so the result is that those individuals who were members of the Watchmen for the most part didn't want to hand over their identities. And so instead of coming forward and saying, I, Dan Dryberg, am Night Owl, and I'm going to continue to be a superhero, to be a vigilante, he simply just walked away. And that's where Rorschach has this sort of resentment when it comes to these characters. Rorschach is by all standards of measurement an anti-hero. The idea is that because there's a bit of resentment here on behalf of Rorschach with regards to the fact that Dan Dryborg just doesn't really have any information here, he's not really able to offer any insight on who it was that killed Comedian, but more so than that, Dryberg was one of the guys who just quit and gave up when superheroes were outlawed. Ultimately, he ends up moving on. Now, of course, this leads us into the methods that Rorschach uses to gain information, but also the nature of Rorschach himself. Again, going into the events before Watchmen, Rorschach made a name for himself as a guy who did whatever it took to figure out what it was that he needed to know, which included beating up bad guys, torturing people. He walks into this bar, people immediately know who he is, and they are terrified of him. Now, a couple of new guys here and there who were new to the criminal element, the criminal underworld, really kind of offer some sniggering remarks. They really just sort of, you know, say some inappropriate things and sort of scoff him off. But those who were in the know, those people who know who Rorschach is are perfectly aware of the fact that he's not a bear that you poke and prod. And so when this guy starts going around and mouthing off, he immediately gains the attention of Rorschach. Rorschach breaks his fingers and tells everybody else, the same fate awaits you if you don't tell me what I need to know. But the problem with this, and really the idea that's being purported here, is that with enough pain and enough torture, people who have information will reveal that information. In truth, this is one of the big uh, arguments against the concept of torture. If you torture a person for information, they'll say what Whatever they need to say in order to make the torture stop. So you can't really take this information with gospel truth, but for the sake of this comic, they're just kind of going with it. Alan Moore's just kind of like, hey, look, these guys don't really know anything. Take it for what it's worth and we'll move on. And so again, that's why Rorschach is one of the, the pivotal characters when it comes to the Watchmen mythos, because he's literally giving us a tour of all these different members who were part of the Watchmen somewhere along the line. Ozymandias, the guy who was basically sitting around and instead of walking away from the superhero landscape and giving it all up, he embraced embraced it. He said, yeah, I am Ozymandias. And then he turned around and started profiteering it. Now, the reason why this is also important is because Veidt is considered to be one of the smartest people on the face of the earth. I believe he's the smartest man that's out there. And the idea here is that it makes perfect sense that if he can capitalize on his own name, if he can capitalize by basically drawing in those who supported the Watchmen and in turn creating action figures, creating products that people will in turn buy, he can quite literally build this massive enterprise and want for nothing for the rest of his life. And that's exactly what he did. Having the intelligence to pull it off, that's what makes things so cool. Now, at this point, 
we switch over to Dr. Manhattan. And this is when we get into the idea of the only guy who's really just that powerful. The only guy who's really just super capable in terms of whatever it is that he wants to do. Now, again, as this story goes on, we'll start to get a little more about what it is that his character can do in terms of what he's capable of, the kind of powers he possesses, different things like that. But the idea is that with him popping up on the scene and basically saying, hey, look, the comedian's dead. The question now becomes what other members of the Watchmen is this killer hunting down? And so again, this is kind of a weird scenario when it comes to Manhattan, because who could possibly kill him? How could a person kill someone who's effectively God, who's literally bound by the limits of nothingness, who's bound by the limits of infinity? Now, of course, in the midst of this great big huge discussion with Rorschach talking about the dangers of, of you know, who it is that's coming after Dr. Manhattan, digging up these old skeletons of the Watchmen and so on, of course, it in turn upsets, you know, Miss Jupiter, which in turn, Dr. Manhattan basically throws him out. And that's really it. But again, the idea here is that this starts to focus on the disconnect of Dr. Manhattan from those people in his life. In this instance, it's really him talking to Miss Jupiter and just saying, hey, look, you're gonna go do your own thing. You know, you're gonna be disappointed in the fact that I'm not talking to you. You're gonna be disappointed in the fact that I can't give you the kind of companionship that you want. You're gonna seek out Dan Dryberg. You're gonna go have dinner with him. So tell him I said, hey. Now, this is one of those interesting situations when it comes to Manhattan, because people will say that Dr. Manhattan is a character who's curious about humanity. In truth, I would say Dr. Manhattan's a character who's transcended humanity. That's one of the big points where this character as the Watchmen goes on, eventually he just gets bored of the petty squabbles of humanity. And it makes sense. It's like if you're the smartest man in the room and you're hearing people squabble over whether or not two plus two equals four. I mean, you're, you're literally just listening to the dumbest people in the world argue about things that don't really matter. And so in response to this, his whole idea is to basically begin the process of walking away from it all. Now, at the interim, we've gotten to the point where he's basically just working on this sort of infinite energy that exists out there. This idea that he alongside Adrian Veidt can begin the process of creating infinite energy for everyone. Now, again, that's why this whole thing comes into play because it's really just, hey, he's doing this because what else does he have to do? There's really nothing else out there that keeps him interested, that keeps him entertained. It keeps his mind at work. The result of this is that when the time comes, he's going to bail out because he's just going to get tired of working on all this. But of course, with Miss Jupiter, she basically takes off, goes to see Dan Dryberg. And of course, with the two of them, they basically begin just kind of reliving these old moments. And one of the funny things about this, and you'll recall this from the movie, is they talk about a character named Captain and carnage. The funny thing about this is that he was this guy uh, who basically just like ran around and committed crimes just so he could get beat up. And the funny thing about this is that again, this hits at this like really basic nature of heroes. And that's kind of the cool thing here because we'll, we'll talk about this in relation to the old school DC here in a second. But of course, running into Rorschach, the question, you know, that, that's asked here is, well, whatever happened to Captain Carnage? And it's like, well, you know, he tried that on Rorschach and he dropped him down an elevator shaft. <laughs> Guy's got no patience. But again, this hits back home to the old school DC Comics. The best example that I can give, and really the, the best stories I would suggest, is something called World's Greatest Superheroes. World's Greatest Superheroes, if you ever read stories, or you ever, you know, looked up Google images of Alex Ross art, you'll see these stories that are really, really short, and it's like Batman, and it's Superman, and I believe Wonder Woman in the Flash. I do not believe there's one on Green Lantern. But the idea here is that World's Greatest Superheroes were basically stories about the 1930s and 1940s superheroes in terms of the actions that they did. But the nature of Alex Ross art in conjunction with that storytelling is that it wasn't meant to depict Superman as this godly being with incredible power who can pull planets out of a dying galaxy. Instead, it was basically designed to humanize Superman. The costume wasn't fancy, flamboyant, or anything like that. It was literally something you'd look like you'd buy at a costume shop. Batman was the exact same way. They were basic. They were simple. It was really more like people wearing costumes as opposed to these godly beings wearing costumes. What this did is it created a feeling of familiarity. It created this idea that they are just people. And that's what this is designed to do. It's designed to basically say, these aren't gods. They're not these impossibly powerful beings. Instead, they're just some folks who got together and wanted to fight crime. Now, of course, Dr. Manhattan's story is a lot more complex, and he served a far greater purpose in the world than any of the other members of the Watchmen did. But again, I really hope this gives you guys an idea of what the Watchmen are about, what they really are for the most part in terms of how they function, in terms of how they come together, and this path that basically sets them on this, this collision course for the ultimate end of the events that of course will come at the end of these 12 videos. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.